because this film begins without the usual main title, this leader is provided to enable you to focus the projector and to adjust the sound level before the actual picture begins. After doing this, if you will shut off the projector when this title fades out, you will be able to start your showing with a sharp picture and the correct sound level without further adjustment whenever the time arrives. Thank you. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm the American hunter. I'm also a doctor. Sometimes I'm a truck driver. And sometimes I'm a farmer. I'm a banker. A preacher. A telephone lineman. But as I said, I'm a hunter. The American hunter. I'm more than 20 million of your fellow citizens who go afield each year in search of game ranging from rabbits to moose, from quail to geese. And just as Americans are a varied lot, so too are we hunters a varied lot. We're black, we're white, we're red, we're rich, and poor. We're young. I got him! I got him! And old. With most of us somewhere in between. And sometimes we're female. Good dog, give. Some of us have been Ernest Hemingway and Zane Gray, Daniel Boone, Lewis and Clark, and some of us have even been president of these United States. While others of us helped as best we could to unite them. So why is it that today, 200 years later, some Americans seem possessed by a fanatical urge to discredit both the sport of hunting and those of us who hunt, vehemently proclaiming that hunting and hunters, along with their firearms, have no place in the 20th century. That this is no fit activity for civilized man. Is there nothing to be said in support of the views of more than 20 million Americans? or of the additional millions of European, Canadian, Latin American, African, and Asian hunters? Are we all, the many, many millions of us, slobs and brutes with our firearms mainly responsible for the crime and violence in our cities? Yet, this is precisely what the editors of many of our leading newspapers and news magazines as well as most of the executives and commentators of the TV networks would have you believe, often running faked and totally dishonest film sequences to prove their outrageously biased points of view. Is there no intellectual justification for hunting today other than our own vague need to do so? Indeed, there is. Perhaps far more than our pseudo-intellectual detractors will ever know about or care to admit. This book I was about to read once again as the camera came upon me is the recently translated work of Spain's leading philosopher of the 20th century, José Ortega y Gasset, who occupied the chair of metaphysics at the University of Madrid for over a quarter of a century. He was a member of parliament under the Spanish Republican government and is the author of The Revolt of the Masses. This material, first written in 1942, has since been published in Spanish, Japanese, German, and Dutch. Consider now Meditations on Hunting and what the great Spanish philosopher Jose Ortega y Gasset had to say on this subject. Just as the leaping stack tempts the hunter, 
The topic of hunting has often tempted me as a writer. My intention is to clarify a little this activity in which devoted men engage with such scrupulousness, constancy, and dedication. I say that life is given to us empty. In itself, life is insipid because it is a simple being there. So for man, existing becomes a poetic task, like the playwrights or the novelists, that of inventing a plot for his existence, giving it a character which will make it appealing. Forceps. But the fact is that for almost all men, the major part of life consists of obligatory occupations, tasks, which they would never do out of choice. And what torments us about work is that by filling up our time with it, it seems to take time from us. Life, used for work, does not seem to us to be really ours, which it should be, but on the contrary seems to be the annihilation of our real existence. This is true to such an extent that the man who works does so with the more or less vague hope of one day winning through this work the liberation of his life, of being able in time to stop working, to start really living. Ortega goes on to point out that while these obligatory occupations have changed radically over the centuries, it is astonishing just how little change there's been in man's way of enjoying himself whenever he has a respite from hard work. What kind of man has been least oppressed by work and the most easily able to engage in being happy? Obviously, the aristocratic man. Now, this greatly liberated man has always done the same things, competed in physical activity, raced horses, gathered at parties, the feature of which is usually dancing, and engaged in conversation. But before any of these, and consistently more important than all of them, has been hunting. This is what kings and nobles and men of wealth have always preferred to do. And Choose at random any period in the vast and continuous flow of history, and you will also find that both men of the middle class and poor men have usually made hunting their happiest activity. So we discover, whether we want to or not, with satisfaction or anger, that the most appreciated, enjoyable activity for the normal man has always been hunting. So it took a philosopher to make clear to us that for centuries, for both aristocrats and working men alike, the number one diversion or relaxation has always been hunting. But how very little of a real effort of hunting is suggested in words like diversion, relaxation, entertainment. A good hunter's way of hunting is a, a hard task which demands much from man. He must keep himself fit, face extreme fatigues, accept danger. So, in my presentation of hunting as what it is, as a form of happiness, I have avoided calling it pleasure. Happy activities, it is clear, are not merely pleasures. They are efforts, and real sports are efforts. It is not possible to distinguish work from sport by a plus or a minus in fatigue. The difference is that sport is an effort made completely freely for the pure enjoyment of it, while work is an obligatory effort made with an eye to the profit. Ortega points out that the true sportsman always honors his hunter's code of ethics whether in solitude or under the watchful eye of a game warden. Unfortunately, not all hunters are true sportsmen, but the illegal and unsporting actions of those few who are not still reflects unfavorably upon all of us. 
for most of us, hunting is surely far too important a part of our lives to permit it to be jeopardized by those few who are not even serious huntsmen. Now that we have realized that hunting is such a universal and impassioned sport, that it belongs in the class of the purest forms of human happiness, the realization only serves to increase our appetite for inquiring why this is so. Let us now work toward a definition of hunting, of the essence of hunting. Difficulties in defining the act of hunting originates in the fact that we are afraid of confusing the issue even more if we accept the most obvious thing in the world, namely that hunting is not an exclusively human activity. The cat hunts rats. The lion hunts antelope. The spider hunts flies. The sharks prey upon smaller fish. The bird of prey hunts rabbits and doves. Hunting is therefore not even peculiar to mammals. Hunting is an occurrence between two animals, one of which is the agent and the other the subject, one the hunter and the other the hunted. In the course of hunting, a fight may occur, as in the case of a wild boar, which, when cornered, turns and attacks the hunter. But this fight has only incidental significance within the hunt, and whatever grave consequences result, it is only an anecdote embroidered on the main tapestry of hunting. Fighting is mutual aggression. In hunting, however, the question is always that of one animal striving to hunt while the other strives not to be hunted. The essential inequality between the prey and the hunter does not keep the pursued animal from being able to surpass the pursuer in one endowment or another. He may be faster or stronger or more alert. However, in the general balance of endowments, the hunter will always have the ultimate advantage over the hunted. But vice versa, if there is to be a hunt, this superiority of the hunter over the prey cannot be absolute. At this moment, the unnoticed hunter could easily have shot the rough grouse on the ground before the preoccupied bird noticed him and took flight. But then the bird would not have had its chance or the opportunity to utilize its characteristic defenses against the hunter. And so, the equation of the hunt would not have been complete. If this man had shot the bird on the ground, he would not truly have been hunting, nor would he be a hunter. It is not really essential to the hunt that it be successful. On the contrary, if the hunter's efforts were always and inevitably triumphant, it would not be hunting, it would be something else. The fascination of this sport lies in the fact that its conclusion is always problematical. As weapons became more and more effective, man imposed more and more limitations on himself as the animal's rival in order to leave it free to practice its wily defenses. Man opens this margin to the beast deliberately and of his own free will. He restrains his destructive power, limits and regulates it. The veto par excellence is the closed season by which he strives to ensure the life of the species. There is then in the hunt as a sport a, a supremely free renunciation by man of the overwhelming supremacy of his powers. We seek and accept increased accuracy in our rifles and sights for they help reduce the likelihood of wounded game. But we do not use the most fully automatic rifles or excessively large bore shotguns. And for some type of game, we have restricted our sporting arms to three shot capability. Indeed, for sporting as well as aesthetic reasons, some sportsmen prefer single shot rifles and double barrel shotguns. Others go afield with bow and arrow, or with muzzle-loading flintlock and percussion firearms. Because of the challenge offered by such primitive arms, 
And it has been primarily through the efforts and money provided by hunters that such once endangered species as our pronghorn antelope and wild turkey are once again plentiful. It is hunters who are fighting to protect and improve waterfowl breeding areas and working hard to save the habitat of all wildlife from the brutal onrush of our industrial civilization, from bulldozer, factories, highways, people, and pollution of all types. Misuse of our land, plus industrial and chemical poisoning, not hunters, are the grave threat to our wildlife. A pity that the enemies of hunting don't back their professed love of wildlife with the same sort of funds that we hunters do. At this point, we arrive at the terminus, the goal of hunting itself. The hunter does not just come and go, working in valley and on cliffs. In the last analysis, he kills. <laughs> In utilitarian hunting, the true purpose of a hunter, what he seeks and values, is the death of the animal. Everything else that he does is merely a means of achieving that end. But in hunting as a sport, this order of means to end is reversed. To the sportsman, the death of the game is not what most interests him. That is not his sole purpose. What most interests him is everything that he had to do to achieve that death. That is the hunt itself. Death is essential because without it, there is no authentic hunting. The killing of the animal is the natural end of the hunt and the goal of hunting itself, not necessarily of the hunter. To sum up, one does not hunt in order to kill. On the contrary, one kills in order to have truly hunted. Ortega goes on to say, if one were to present the sportsman with the death of the animal as a gift, he would refuse it. Consider that thought again. If one were to present the sportsman with the death of the animal as a gift, he would refuse it. How true that is. That fact is what makes it so very difficult to convey the true meaning of the hunt to another person, especially a non-hunter. To see an elephant or a deer, or even some geese being killed during the course of a hunting film, invariably offends the spectator to some extent, even one who himself hunts, simply because the viewer can never actually enter into the hunting relationship that existed during the reality of the hunt. One therefore tends to reject even the filmic gift of the death of an animal. Hunting can never be a spectator sport, for its true mystic force can only be experienced by the hunter in the act of hunting. In all this, the moral problem of hunting has not been resolved. Strictly speaking, the essence of sportive hunting is not raising the animal to the level of man. As Walt Disney has done in all of his cartoon and animal films. But something much more spiritual than that. A conscious and almost religious humbling of man, which limits his superiority and lowers him towards the animal. As I have already pointed out, a fascinating mystery of nature is manifested in the universal fact of hunting, the inexorable hierarchy among living things. Every animal is in a relationship with regard to every other. Strict equality is exceedingly improbable and incongruous. Life is a fierce conflict. Hunting submerges man deliberately in that formidable mystery and therefore contains something of a religious rite and emotion in which homage is paid to what is divine, transcendent in the laws of nature. 
The American Indian had this reverence for the game that he hunted. Today, we modern Americans usually take far too casual an attitude toward our quarry. Dressing out a magnificent elk as though it were a mere barnyard animal, or dropping a handsome game bird into the back of a pickup truck without even a second glance. By demeaning the game we hunt, we demean our sport, and ultimately ourselves as hunters. Why should we hesitate to honor a fine adversary which we have bested on the field? In order to subsist, early man had to dedicate himself wholly to hunting. Paleolithic man, the oldest that we know, and the one who was the supreme hunter, was a man while still an animal, a beast whose intellect glowed from time to time in his intimate darkness. In these conditions, he hunted. Because early weapons were insufficient for killing most free animals, hunting was either forcing game over a cliff or capturing it in traps or with nets and snares. Once the prey was caught, it was beaten and speared to death. But reason grows stronger. Man invents more and more effective weapons and techniques. In this direction, Man grows further away from the animal, raising his level further above that of the beast. But along parallel lines, atrophy of his instincts increases also, and he grows away from his pristine intimacy with nature. From being essentially a hunter, he passes to being essentially a herdsman. Very soon he turns from herdsman to farmer. The use of his legs, his lungs, his senses of smell, of direction, of the winds, of the trails, all diminish. All this reduces his advantage over the animal. The man who uses a rifle or shotgun today does not generally live continuously on plains or in forests. Rather, he goes there only for a few days. Thus, progress in weaponry is somewhat compensated for by regression in the capability of the hunter. Yet, when the moment of any hunt actually arrives, reason does not interfere in any greater degree than it did in primitive times. This suggests that the general lines of the hunt are identical today with those of 5,000 years ago. It doesn't take a man-killing tiger to set a modern hunter's adrenaline to flowing. While there's plenty of excitement in the taking of a white-tailed deer or a black bear, a mountain goat, or even a sharp-tailed grouse. And for a boy, the bagging of a rabbit or a woodchuck or his first mallard drake is a moment to be remembered for the rest of his life. Thus, the principle which inspires hunting for sport is that of artificially perpetuating that early state in which, already human, man still lived within the orbit of animal existence. Man submerged in the greater complexity of his present existence normally feels nostalgia for the past, and even more for humanity's past than for his own individual past but there is no possible evasion. Man cannot return to any previous age. He is assigned, like it or not, to a future that is always, in fact, new and different, whether or not it is called progress. But since it is impossible to completely transfer our life to a previous period of existence, why not do so at least partially for a little while in order to rest from the painful situations of the here and now. This would be the great diversion of today's man. Let us see what I can do for you. Where do you want to go? Do you want to be a good bourgeois of Versailles? One of Plutarch's men? A 16th century Spanish nobleman? A Christian in the style of St. Augustine? But do not bother to choose. You cannot be any of these, even for a minute. Any attempt to bring it off will end, at best, 
in an unsatisfactory farce, a mere masquerade. This is the recent manhunt. When you are fed up with a troublesome present, with being very 20th century, you take your gun, whistle for your dog, and go to the mountain. And without further ado, give yourself the happiness during a few hours or a few days of being Paleolithic. And men of all eras have been able to do the same without any difference except in the weapon employed. Natural man is always there, under the changeable historical man. We can call him and he comes, a little sleepy, benumbed, without all his early instincts, but, after all, still alive. When modern man sets out to hunt, what he does is not a fiction, not a farce. It is essentially the very same thing that Paleolithic man did. The hunter is, at one and the same time, a man of today and one of 10,000 years ago. Hunting alone permits us the greatest luxury of all, the ability to enjoy a vacation from the human condition through an authentic immersion in nature. But man cannot re-enter nature except by temporarily rehabilitating that part of himself which is still an animal. And this, in turn, can only be achieved by placing himself in relation to another animal. But there is no animal, pure animal, other than the wild one. And the relationship with him is the hunt. Thus contemplated, we can readily understand the fact that hunting has perpetually occupied the highest rank in the scale of man's happiness. Ortega has not been the only philosopher with a genuine understanding of what hunting means to civilized man. Polybius, one of the greatest minds of ancient Greece, was a hunter. So, too, was Plato. Tolstoy and Turgenev hunted. The composer Verdi was an ardent duck hunter. In our own time, Winston Churchill, the man who both made history and wrote about it, enjoyed hunting. Bernard Baruch, advisor and confidant of presidents, was a dedicated quail hunter. No 20th century man need ever feel ashamed of his love for the noble sport of hunting, for it has had the support and understanding of men whose intellectual brilliance far outshines that of any editorial writer or columnist. Men whose cultural contributions clearly overshadow those of our TV executives whose specialty is the mindless violence and brutality that they peddle in the guise of entertainment. So why should over 20 million Americans who hunt both for recreation and for food allow their lifestyle to be condemned by men satisfied with the feel of pavement beneath their feet for all the days of the year and to have their horizons limited by a fence of office buildings? As Ortega said, the hunter is the man of today and all the yesterdays. Not merely a man for all seasons, but a man for all centuries. For all ages. Truly, the universal man. The indestructible man. <laughs>